Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our afternoon session uh, today uh, on um, this Saturday afternoon. Um, it's a special presentation. We have not been doing this kind of presentations in a while. And uh, today we have a special topic that we are addressing how to cope and deal with adultery after it has happened. Um, it has been a, a thought that has been on my mind, particularly because I have been dealing with many of such uh, in counseling, and I thought maybe one needs to have a presentation where we address this particular issue uh, and as we start we will start with prayer heavenly father we pray that you speak to me speak through me and where necessary bypass me and speak directly to your children who are gathered online in jesus name we pray amen now, how to cope and deal with uh, adultery after it has happened. And let me start by talking about the prevalence of adultery in our society today. Uh, a research organization, Afrocritique, has says uh, marriage cheating in Africa, in their survey, says up to 58% of married men and 51% of married women are adulterous. Uh, that's the research in Africa. Another organization in South Africa uh, is, uh, called Heaven Affairs has found out that 62% of African men are cheaters whereas the other 38 percent were female now when we look into the whole issue of uh, infidelity and we look particularly into the cost of it the emotional cost of it um, and other challenges that are related to that in their statistics we will realize that more and more there is an increase in um, women who are also moving into the adultery space. Um, uh, in fact, one statistic says the women young, there is an increase of young women who are married uh, who in their adultery is even bypassing those of young married women, young married men, uh, whereas older men they, is still on time high. So, and one of the things that touched me in terms of the prevalence of infidelity uh, in counseling was this young man who said, yeah, this young lady says, she found out on her husband's phone that on a Monday morning, her friends ask him about the body count or the number of women that he, the husband, had managed to sleep with over the weekend. That's how bad that young men are even competing with each other in terms of the number of women they can sleep with. Um, now, I've also had an increase in counseling of women who are married, who are cheating on their spouses, who are asking me for help on how they can stop having those affairs. Others are cheating with their, with their bosses and, and so on and so forth. So these are not hearsay. These are people who come to me and say, how can you help us in terms of stopping the relationships that we find ourselves in um, and I'll never forget this one day I went to Midrand and uh, um, I was going to see one man and it, it was in a company where they've got this, this open plan environment and I was talking to this man doing whatever our business we were doing and then there was a group of men about five or six of them 
they were all talking about adultery. They were all talking, they were saying, all of us are doing it. So, you know what, we must just need to help each other on how to help make sure that you're, you're, you don't get caught and how what you must do when you're caught to get out of that tricky situation. And I, it was quite a, a few years ago, probably about, you know, um, seven, eight years ago. So then I, I thought to myself, I mean, as a man of God, I can't just allow this thing to happen. So I decided to intervene on them. And then I said to them, oh, I'm a married man of 23 or 22 years. I can't remember how many years. I said, I don't cheat. I'm not involved in any form of adultery. And these guys came to me like a ton of bricks. They said, you are lying. You are lying. There is no man who doesn't cheat. So you are lying. You must stop it. Even pastors are cheating. There is no man. They came so hard, I decided to withdraw and go back to the discussion that I was having with this man um, on the side. But that shows you the prevalence of it and also the view that many believe that everybody has to be doing it in our society. So going back to the cost of uh, adultery or the, the emotional cost of adultery, it is said that adultery is one of the most emotionally devastating events that can ever happen in a marriage, ranked up there with the death of a spouse. So the pain of adultery when somebody cheats on you in marriage is said to be at the same magnitude as the death of a spouse. Now, others say it's worse than death. Now, adultery has got painful consequences to the individual because it shatters trust, it destroys intimacy, and has got many other consequences that it has in terms of the relationship. Um, now, not only that, um, it breaks up families, it ruins careers, it leaves a trail of destruction uh, on its path, and it affects even generations uh, to come. Um, it leaves orphans, uh, many children who do not have parents, as others have the whole family is destroyed by things like HIV AIDS. Now, in Bible times, it was a very serious offense. The adulterers had to be stoned to death. Uh, but in our age, um, I don't know whether you have noticed that um, television has tried to trivialize adultery. Uh, you realize that television and movies today, in the past, television used to reflect society, but today it's programming society. And I'll give you an example. Um, you will be watching some soapies and they will sh show you a guy who is either ill-treated or a man or woman who is ill-treated by their spouse. And in their ill-treatment, they end up finding somebody on the side. They end up having an affair. And those of us who are watching, we end up with a view that says, ah, yeah, at least he needs a break or she needs a break because television is programming us to accept adultery as a normal uh, thing. But when it happens to you as an individual, the fact that it has been trivialized in the media, when it happens to you, the pain is real and there is nothing that compares to you to it. It, it. There is a feeling for the innocent party of betrayal of a highest form, something that you cannot, you've got a challenge in dealing with and in trying to deal with that particular pain that you are experiencing. Now, for the guilty party, there is humiliation, there is shame, there is embarrassment, there is a loss of respect from children children from the community from the church from the in-laws and i'll never forget this this is the story of this um young lady um, i used to work with when i was working as a consultant in new york she was from the philippines and we happened to talk about this issue of infidelity she says my father my father was like a hero he says when he used to come back from work we would rush towards him 
carry his bag and go with him home and when he gets home he will sit on the on the in the chair who will bring him his favorite drink and he says but my father started having an affair on the other side of town he started having a mistress he says even when he came back home he was a shadow of what he used to be he says there was no one who went to run to him there was nobody to to hold his bag there was no one uh, who was there to give him his drink he says he was a shadow of what he used to be now when when you have been cheated on when you have found out that your partner has committed adultery the reactions of finding out vary from one person to another others there is an external focus a violent response we have heard about people who killed their spouses for infidelity or who went and killed their partners for infidelity there is people who in their anger in their because adultery if you can try to understand is that if the two have been made one and if love and the, the, the love in marriage has joined their hearts adultery does not just do like divorce that tears them that does them pulls them apart it tears the union into half it cuts their heart into half uh, the pain that one experiences uh, many others end up with this violent uh, um, uh, response towards it others they internalize the pain there are some who blame themselves some become destroyed by the pain of 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 what they've experienced i remember the story i think it happened in zimbabwe of this young man who i think was an engineer or something he got married and in this wonderful expensive wedding um beautiful wedding and a month later he came back home to find out that his beloved new bride uh, was sleeping with another man in their bedroom just a month after they were married and this young man went to the nearest bridge and he committed suicide um he he the the, the pain uh, of this that happened was just beyond anything that he could handle and as a result of that he went and committed um suicide um others choose to divorce um others they become depressed they as they internalize what has happened depression sets in i know of someone who was close to me who could not handle the pain of the husband who left her after all that she had done she she had married this guy we, without anything without any qualification she took him to school and and after he, finishing university he got he, he he got a job and 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 soon thereafter he got a younger woman as he now has afforded a, a nice car and so on and so on when this happened when she found out this and when the men are not coming home she couldn't handle this the depression sets in she became disabled because of depression and later on she died as a result of that um to others there is a destruction of self esteem as you look into yourself and 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 you thought you were somebody uh, particularly it happens to both men and women uh, you, you thought you were somebody and to find out that this person that you so much trusted um, is going out with somebody else he, he, is it because i'm not man enough is it because i'm not woman enough is it because she is a yellow bone is it because she has got the figure or this or is it because he is better than me in bed or all of these things sets in depression 
um, as it shatters self-esteem. Uh, to others, there is bitterness um, that comes in uh, out of these things, this being rejected, being put down, being uh, viewed as nothing. And all of these emotions brings about uh, a lot of pain to people who then find out about this. To others, I, there, is a, there is a searching for answers, wanting to know why. Why did you do this? What was wrong with me? Um, uh, the, the search to find out the details. What did you do with this person? How many times did you do it? How did you do it? Where did you do it? Hoping that in searching for answers, they will find healing for their pain. Was he or she better than me? Now, the more they ask these things, the more they hurt themselves. The more the pain gets deeper. Because they fail to realize that he who has hurt you is not the one who is going to heal you. That there is someone else who is the healer. There is someone else who through his stripes we are healed. And as I look at these different responses, while I understand the pain, and I want to say to someone there out there today that when you find out this, a violent response does not answer. When you find out that someone does not care about you. I was talking to, to, to my neighbor. He's a high court judge and we were sitting under a tree the other day. And he was saying to me, many men, they say, if I find my partner sleeping with someone else, I will um, shoot them or shoot them both or, or something like that. And he says to me, if you find two consenting adults sleeping together um, and you kill them or you kill one of them, you're going to face 25 years to life in prison. And if you have killed your spouse, that means your children will end up in foster care. And then when you go to prison, you will end up being somebody's girlfriend in prison. Think before you react and overreact and you do things that just makes your situation even worse. Um, committing suicide. Would you, why would you kill yourself for someone who doesn't care about you? Even for someone who cares about you, you don't kill yourself, but how much more? There are still 3 billion other people there who love you and appreciate you and accept you. Why would you kill yourself for someone who doesn't care about you? We will deal with the issues of depression and self-esteem um, later on. And then you've got culprits who, with pride, who even though they are caught red-handed, they still struggle to apologize. Sometimes they will blame the innocent party. Sometimes because they've got pride, the exposure of their sin bust their bubble to the point where they don't even want to be part of the relationship. Because pride does not allow them, they, they expose of who they are, they truly are. They cannot handle that situation. Now, the truth of the matter is, people are getting caught much sooner than in the years past. And I, I would like to believe, and I, and I think it is important for us to realize that no matter how careful you are in deleting messages, no matter how careful you are in removing the call logs, no matter how careful you are to, to do it in another town or in another city or in another province or in another country, we need to realize that people are not caught because they are reckless. They are not caught because somebody called at the wrong time. 
they are caught because the devil is in charge of the adultery curriculum. And as soon as he gets you hooked into adultery, it is his job to expose you. You see, and the devil is more serious in destroying families now than ever before because we're moving at the end of time. And he knows that good, fam good families makes good communities, good communities make good nations, and good nations make the world a better place. So he has focused. He knows that the family is a fountain of life. Now he has decided that he's going to poison the fountain so that people get sick downstream, so that people get disease downstream. So the devil is focused in destroying families now more than ever before. So he's exposing people more now than ever before. In the past, our grandfathers and, and our fathers, we used to find out during the funeral that there were other children who were standing next to the, to, the, to, the, to the grave who looked like the deceased. But the devil is no longer doing that now. He's no longer leaving it until the end. Now he's exposing them now because he wants to destroy families. He wants to destroy societies now more than ever before. And that's why today... You know, it's important for us to realize that if you are involved today, if you are cheating on your spouse today, you better repent today because you're going to get caught. The reason why you have not been caught so far is grace. It's grace because some relationship can recover from infidelity. And grace has made sure that your sin remains hidden. And I heard a preacher say the other day that... The devil has got 99 blankets. So you do wrong, he covers you. You do wrong, he covers you. He gives you another blanket. Blanket number two, blanket number three, blanket number four. But he's counting the blankets that he's giving to you. And you get used to be covered. You get used to cover it, to get away with it. You get used to it. But you don't know you have reached blanket number 99. And after you reach blanket number 99, he exposes you. You see, you do something wrong, you're hoping to get the cover. But the devil says, no, I have got new recruits whom I need to cover. I will expose you so that everybody else to see. And I'll destroy you. And I'll destroy your family. Now, most people who are caught, um, their response particularly if they're men, they teach each other. The general response is deny, deny, deny. Those are the three things that they specialize in, deny, deny, deny. Um, and so in this um, meeting of men and that I was listening, um, they were teaching each other even strategies on what to say and how to do it when you came home late and the one that blew up my mind was how this one guy um, um, says um, this is what you need to do um, he says um, uh, say he, he, he overslaps at the girlfriend whatever thing wakes up at three o'clock he realizes he's in trouble he goes to the nearest police station because our police are corrupt he gives the policeman 500 rand to arrest him and put him inside behind in the cells and then gives the policeman the, the wife's phone, phone, phone number and the wife calls calls they call the wife to say your husband has been arrested here since half past six uh for whatever whatever misdemeanor that he, he could he, he, he could have done and the wife comes up with another 500 rand feeling pity for the husband not knowing it's all a plan deny 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 um, and sometimes they blame the innocent party you are the one who made me to do this and this deny thing goes crazy and and this is this is the madness i i, I suppose some sins are sell sold in a combo you see you can't do adultery without the combo sin of of lying because they 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 go together so the sins they go in a combo the way people who commit adultery can make you crazy. 
So a woman can find a man in the bedroom with his with another woman. And uh, she says, what is going on here? The other woman puts on dress up and leave. And after she left, the woman, the wife remains and says, but what are you doing? What is this? And the man says, what? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? He says, the woman who was here. And he says, which woman? What are you talking about? Until the woman, her own sanity is challenged. Until she thinks that maybe there's something wrong with her her own mind. Which woman? Where was the woman? What are you talking about? Until she thinks she's crazy. That's what they do. <laughs> the, the crazy one, I don't know however how true the story is, but I heard of a guy who who was in the neighborhood and um, he the husband came, the real husband, he was with this, having an affair with a married woman. The husband arrived and he ran out naked out of through the window and he ran and he ran and he got home when he got home he started saying to the wife i was hijacked and they took my clothes they took everything and everything as the car and everything as they took my clothes i arrived here in because he was naked and the wife was laughing and the man says, what kind of a woman is this? You don't care about what has happened to me? And the wife was just laughing. And he says, you don't care about the pain and whatever I've suffered. I almost died. The wife was just laughing. And then at the end, the wife says, so after they take your clothes and took your car, then they put a condom on you. Is that what they did? Because in the haste of running away from wherever, he forgot to take away something else that he was wearing. But that's the crazy things about women and uh, society that we live in uh, in this age and time. It is, it is that kind of an, a madness in terms of people who are caught. Now, the irony of this it's someone who says, but I love you. But you are the one that I love. I don't love the other woman, but I love you. Now, that's contradicting to the idea of love. Now, as we said in the beginning, infidelity is emotionally most devastating event that can ever happen in marriage. It is the greatest pain you can cause to anyone. That's the greatest pain. Now, how can you say to someone that you cause the greatest pain that I love you? What kind of love is that that will cause this person the greatest pain ever possible? Because this is like putting a sword in somebody's heart and turning it. And you still say you are the one that I love. It's contradicting to the concept and the idea of love. In fact, you won't do such a pain to an enemy. How much more to somebody that you say you love? And it is important that we start thinking through these things. When the temptation comes up to realize, do I want to cause the person I love the greatest pain ever possible? And then turn around and say, oh, you are the one that I love. You can, it cannot be love. In fact, you are better off not buying me flowers. You are better off not doing me anything, not giving me gifts. At least you don't cheat on me. You are better off leaving my heart as it is, not massaging my heart or taking care of my heart instead of stabbing it with the pain that is the greatest form of pain. So the idea that the other woman I don't love, you are the one that I love. No, you can't be. If you truly love, and I'm saying this for those of you who love your partners, if you truly love, that's the last thing you want to do to them. Now, let's come to the key of addressing the aftermath of infidelity. What is the key position from which we can address the aftermath of infidelity. Uh, how do we deal with this 
And how can we cope with this? And I believe the key issue for us to understand is this. Understanding that infidelity is not a marital problem, but a spiritual problem. This understanding is key in addressing the aftermath of infidelity. You see, it would have been a marital problem if it is your spouse who says thou shalt not commit adultery. But it's not. It is God who says thou shalt not commit adultery. We don't even know why he said it. We don't know his reasons. So anyone who commits adultery, it's first and foremost attacking God directly. First and foremost is lifting a middle finger to God. He is rebelling against God. He's saying to God, I don't obey you. You are not my God. I, you're, you're not my, I, I obey my feelings. I obey my boyfriend. I obey my girlfriend. So the first thing we need to understand is that infidelity, it's an attack on God. It's an attack on authority of God. It's an attack on his, on, on his, on his position as the Lord and God. Now, and that your partner it's a secondary, it's, it's in, in fact, it's a casualty of the attack on God. So God has created a wall to protect your partner. And he says, thou shall not. And you go and attack God and attack his laws. And your partner is a casualty of the wall of God's instruction that you are, you're pushing. But the real attack is on God. But and, 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 and that is important because the only thing that makes one not to cheat on their partners is not the love of their partner. It's not that they care about their partner. It is the fear of God. The fear of God is at the very foundation of one not cheating. It's not because you are treated right. It's not because you are not treated right. It's because of the fear of God. Now, having that understanding, as I said, it's key. Because many a times when you have been cheated on, you look at yourself and you say, what about me? What have I done? What does the other person have that I don't have? Oh, you're going to depress yourself very quickly. Is it because of how she looks? Is it because of how much money he has? Is it because of the car he drives? Is it because of the figure that she has? No. Let me tell you now. Infidelity is above your pay grade. It's above your pay grade. It has nothing to do with you. It's above you. It has to do with God himself. And the lack or the fear of God or the lack thereof. So it is important for us to realize that this thing is not between you and the other person. It's between the person and God and their lack of fear of God. So don't get yourself depressed. Even if you were an angel, they were going to still cheat on you. Even if you were perfect in all respects, they were still going to cheat on you. I saw this thing on the social media and um, there was this beautiful young lady and a strong, huge Nigerian soldier. And, and, and somebody say uh, the quote was, uh, the caption was like, uh, if women will cheat on soldiers with guns, what about you with your laptop? And, but, but the point Beyond that statement is that no, it has nothing to do. That's why they cheat on soldiers, on policemen and, and cheat on all kinds of... Because it has to do with the fear of God. And of course, the devil will tell you that you will not get caught. So, so he promises, but then he exposes you. So he promises that you'll never get, get caught, but then he exposes you. So, so, so let's go back and understand that what is happening in our homes is a spiritual warfare. It's, 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 it's an attack that God has captured this human being. And I will never forget. I think it 
it was about two months ago a man came here he was right here in my in my office and the, and the man says to me do you believe that they are demons I said, well, I spent many of my early years as an evangelist, as a public evangelist, running crusades. And there we used to battle with demons head on. I, I, and I, we have chased demons. We have dealt with those. I said, I believe they are demons. He says, and this is the man who has been caught in adultery. So he came for himself. He said, I want you to deal with me. So he says to me, um, there are times when after a weekend, I look back at the things that I've done. I don't believe it is me. I believe there was a spirit that took charge, that took control of my life. You see, one of the things that we need to realize, because, you see, when you enter into that bedroom to have an affair or to that hotel room or whatever room or it is a car, whatever, you enter naked twice. You enter naked physically and enter naked spiritually because these holy angels that protect you, that work with you as a child of God, they can enter with you into that space. So you enter naked twice and the demons have their free will and they take charge of you. And that's why when you live there, they change your appetite so that the same things that you used to enjoy at home, they no longer taste right. Um, and, 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 and somehow they create a storm. When you get home, there is a war because this demon have taken charge. And therefore, we need to realize that we are in a spiritual warfare that is going on in our homes. And a woman called me about three weeks ago. She says, uh, my husband had this affair and ever since then there's never been peace in our home but I've just found out last night that the woman that he had an affair with is actually a sangoma so and, and he, the demons that comes from this woman have remained with him she says there's never been peace because we're dealing with a warfare now I say it's key because firstly, you don't end up going around and saying, um, you know, you know, uh, depressing yourself or destroying your self-esteem because of this person. No, you can't destroy your self-esteem just because somebody does not fear God. Uh, you can't allow your own depression just because somebody does not fear God. No, 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 no. Don't allow that. Uh, the, don't allow yourself to die. Don't commit suicide just because somebody does not fear God. No, don't go around killing people and end up in prison just because somebody does not fear God. No, don't allow that because their conduct is not a reflection on you. It has nothing to do with how you look and how you are and what you do and how you do it. No, 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 no. Uh, one woman, one woman who, who, who came to help in, because she has been having an affair, I asked her, what, why? Does this other guy, does it better than your husband? She says, no, actually, he is lousy. Now, I, I, I don't know. He says he's lousy, this in bed. Now, but somehow she's captivated. The demons are keeping her there. So it has nothing to do with logic. It has nothing to do with the material condition of your relationship. It's not a reflection of your love or your lack thereof. It is somebody's spiritual weakness. And when we understand that, then we know how to deal with it. We know that we are dealing with a warfare, a spiritual warfare which requires us to put on the whole armor of God. When we see this thing happening, instead of getting depressed, we put on the whole armor of God because we are into a spiritual warfare that is out there. And this, your partner, is a victim 
of the enemy. They have been found weak. One writer says, the biggest surprise in marriage should not have been a, a surprise at all. Because the biggest surprise in marriage is that you are married to a sinner. It's just that before marriage, we don't know the brand of a sinner you are married. But you are marrying a sinner. And as soon as you are married, you find that you are married to a cheat, you are married to a liar, you are married to somebody who is an adulterer or whatever. And, and, and all of these are the warfare that the family must get involved in terms of fighting. Now, after it has happened, the question is, are you going to forgive or are you going to leave? Now, leaving a relationship, of which most people tell me, leaving a relationship, which means divorce, might seem easy, but it's not. I don't have time to argue it. I argue it in another presentation, but the total cost of divorce sometimes it's not as it's much higher than the total cost of a bad marriage. Uh, when you look into the impact on children, you looked into the impact on many others around. Uh, um, it sounds easy to just say divorce, but the cost thereof is long, is huge, and it has got impact on generations to come. So it's as long as as much as it seems to be easy to just say. You know, uh, as they say here in um, in Atrechville, uh, Talampia, you know, which means divorce a dog. It, it, it's not as easy as that. In practice, divorce is hard. It's painful. And the researchers have this, followed people who have been divorced 10 years after divorce. And they found out that only 10% of them says their life became better after 10 years of divorce. So divorce is not necessarily the solution. Forgiveness, on the other hand, is not easy. It's not easy. Because the person who has hurt you has no role to play in your forgiveness. And somebody says to err is human and to forgive is divine. And the only way we can be able to forgive is when God has the divinity is in alive within us, the divinity is within us, that God can come inside of us and give us the power to forgive. By ourselves, it's not easy. But it is something that God can do in us as he works in us both to will to forgive and to do forgiveness. Because there will be many triggers. Every time a phone rings, his phone or her phone ring, it's a trigger. Every time you see someone who looks like somebody or even a message coming up on the phone, it's a trigger. Uh, but at the end of the day, for those of us who are Christians, the Bible, the book says, if you, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will not forgive you. So when we then understand that Infidelity was not about me. It's about this person and their God. So if I'm divorcing them, I'm divorcing them because they are a sinner. Because they don't fear God. That's my primary reason. That you don't fear God. And because of that, I'm divorcing you. In fact, the, the response, the proper response for infidelity for Christians should have been to say, darling, why are you doing this to God after all that God has done for us? Why don't you fear God? Why don't you fear God? And I want to say this, and I hope somebody will not misunderstand me. I believe the devil's agenda is not divorce. Devil, the devil's agenda is the total annihilation of the family. So he comes through one person, through infidelity. Maybe, maybe the husband or the wife, he comes through one person. That's the conduit by which the devil comes in. 
And then the devil exposes that person to this partner so that the truth can be known. And after the person has been exposed, the devil says to the one who is innocent, don't forgive. Be filled with anger and bitterness. So the devil wins one person through infidelity, second one through anger and bitterness. And then he says, then for divorce. And when you do that, the children who believe both of you to be Christians, they fall in between and crash. And they are angry with God. So the devil has got, let's say the man with infidelity, the woman through anger and bitterness, and then the children through anger with God. And he's got all of them in hell. And that's why it is important for us to realize that we are in a spiritual warfare. If the devil is going to come with one person, close that hole. Close that hole through forgiveness and through the power of God. Fight the spiritual warfare. You know, um, and I, I, was, um, I, was in, I was in Harare some few years ago and I was speaking at this church. I was doing a family life seminars. In the afternoon, I was doing, I was doing, um, I was doing counseling. And uh, this one woman comes up to me and she says to me, my husband is having an affair. Yeah, she called a, she's got a small house. And, and I was, it was good that I, by then I knew what a small house uh, was because a year before I was in um, another area in the camp meeting with a colored guy from Cape Town. And this guy didn't understand. So he came to me, he says, Mashudu, many women here in the camp meeting are complaining about small houses. Why can't Zimbabwean men build big houses? He didn't understand what a small house was. Uh, but now he, this woman says, uh, my husband has got a small house and he's an elder at the church. When I tell him to stop, he says, why? I only have one small house. Other elders have got two, three small houses. Then she says to me, what must I do? I said, when he comes back home from the small house, treat him like a king. Give him the best food. Tell the children to honor him. She says, ah, I can't do that. I said, this is what you must do. The Bible says, do good for those who do evil. The Bible says, be still. And know that I'm God. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Stand still and see the deliverance. I said, you do good. And let God fight. You stand here. Because when you do good, you are standing on the GPS coordinates of blessings. You are standing at the place where God is going to pour his blessing. I said, even if it doesn't make sense, do it. Stand here. And let God fight. Because many of us don't realize that God cannot fight for us while we're fighting for ourselves. God, you know, because if he fights for us when we're fighting for ourselves, we're going to go around telling people, you see, me, me, I don't take nonsense. Me, I, I dealt with it. Me, 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 I, uh, I'm not that type. Uh, and then God will say, but it was me. So God cannot fight for us while we're fighting for ourselves. God wants us to stand still. And let God fight. And I know God fights. And God does fight. So, and this is a true story. It's a confession of a man who was a cheater. He was a serial cheater. He, I had the confession myself. We, we had gathered, it was a business associate. And we had gathered one time. And, and this man started confessing. He started confessing. Um, he says he went to, to pick up this girl. And uh, he took her, you know, the wife at home is praying, you know, it's not searching the phone, it's not doing all that, he's trusting on God, he's trusting on God, God to fight her battles. So he took this girl to, 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 the, to the hotel, and then when they got to the hotel, they were about to start the ministry, that made them together, so they were there to, to start the ministry. He says he realized that there was no network. He says, I tried everything else, but the network was down. He says, um, he says, I, I went to the, to the bathroom. When he got to the bathroom, he said, I spoke to the network, but nothing could work. The main switch was down. The, there was no connection. He says, no matter what I try, the connection could not come. 
Eventually, he says, I went back to the girl and says, here is the money for transport. Nothing will happen today. And I do believe that God who fights the battles had decided to switch off the network of the whole hotel. If there was somebody else who came with their wives and their spouses, they just say, hey, what's happening today? Because there was one sinner, one Jonah, switch off the whole hotel and nobody is going to have a network connection. Because that's the power of the God that we have. He's able to fight our battle. So when we forgive, it's not weakness. There is power. Because we're connecting with the all-powerful God who is able to fight our battles and be able to succeed at the end of the day. And therefore, we say, not only we save, we save families, we save the community, we save the nation, and we make the world a better place by making sure that families are standing. Steps in healing as we conclude. There needs to be a full confession by the one who is um, guilty without appropriating blame, without having adding an insult to the injury. Oh, it's because you don't like my mother. It's because all kind of nonsense. It's because you didn't give me sex. All kind of nonsense. No, no, without appropriating blame. The, the, the one who is, in us, who is guilty must be willing to confess as it is what they did without blaming the other person. And um, we need to realize that forgiveness does not restore trust. Restoration of trust depends on the offender. So many men will say to me, oh, but she says she forgives me, but doesn't trust me. No, you see, forgiveness does not restore trust. Forgiveness, you see, when you get married, you get trust for free. When you, when you betray the trust, you start from zero. Now you must start from zero to develop the trust you were given for free. And this can take months or years to get it back to what it used to be. So in order to be able to restore the trust, openness, transparency in all things, the phone needs to have a, a, a password. That phone must no longer have a password. It must be given. It must be, it must be open. And in order to avoid being asked, where are you? Pre proactive. Every time I'm leaving the office, I'm going to the shops. From the shops, I'm coming back home. Be proactive so that you don't get asked where you are in terms of your movement. What touched me was a young man who was caught here in um, Kempton Park. Was, they came to me. They was caught, he was caught having two sexual partners. And, um, and we, we spoke about this restoration of trust. And what he did, it touched my heart. He went to the bank and says to the bank, instead of just sending me a text message when I have a transaction in the bank, send two text messages even to my wife. So that every transaction that I do, my wife also sees it. And then he goes to the wife's phone and he puts an app that tracks his movement everywhere that he goes. It tracks his movement. And because of doing that, he's pushing transparency and openness to another level so that the trust can be restored. Because the trust to restoration depends on the offender. And at the end, seek counseling to deal with what happened, why it happened, and also how to restore the marriage. And people have asked me, can marriage ever come back after, after infidelity? No, not only can they come back. Marriages that I've worked with have not only come back, but they've thrived, done better than they were before. Because when, 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 when we look into, into the marriage, many marriages, by the time the infidelity came, they were already sick. So when you deal with the underlying issues and you deal with um, the, 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 the entire marriage and unleash the potential that remains in that marriage, and that marriage is able to thrive and rise into another level. May the Lord bless you uh, and keep you as we conclude in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us to share with your children. There are many here and others who will listen later who are affected by this topic. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray, you said, by your stripes we are healed. And we are praying that you can bring about healing to those who have been hurt. We're praying that you can bring about repentance to those who might still be in, in the area of infidelity even as we speak. We pray for restoration of marriages that have been attacked by infidelity. We're praying for your spirit to overcome the evil, the demons that are raging in families today. Be with us, 
bless us, young and old. And for those who are still young, we pray that you preserve their marriages from such attacks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.